Okay. Everybody here? Okay. Thank you for everyone for coming. As we did this morning, I would like to start our talk with right hand represents the world. Left hand represents the self. By bringing two hands together, we are united with the world and the self. And see yourself in the whole world. You are in everything. And see everything in yourself. You are a microcosm of macrocosm. You have a sun, moon, stars, planets, earth, air, fire, water, electron, proton, soul, spirit, consciousness, everything is in you, in miniature. And then you expand your consciousness and you become the whole world and the whole universe. And then we bow to each other in humility and recognition. Thank you. Okay, this Schumacher experience week has been going for many years and always uh, well attended. And this one is well attended for me. Um, so subject today is head, heart and hands. These three words encapsulate the philosophy and practice of Schumacher experience and Schumacher education. <coughs> In the mainstream education, if you go to University of Hong Kong or University of Oxford or Cambridge or Yale or Harvard or Beijing or Bombay, anywhere, <laughs> all over the world, you go there, teacher will look at you and will think that you have no body. You have no body, no hands, no heart, no legs, just head, just brain. And only half brain. <laughs> because all of us have two hemispheres in our brain. Left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Left hemisphere is scientific, mathematical, organizational, managerial, and practical. The right hemisphere of the brain is more intuitive, imaginative, creative, relational, spontaneous, and spiritual. So university will not touch your right brain, only left brain. And they, you are spending from age five to 20, maybe 15 years of your precious life formative life, when you are just coming into the world, you are strained to think only from your left brain. And no use of heart, no relationship, nobody will teach you compassion, love, kindness, respect, generosity, nothing in our education. And nothing with your hands. You don't have to make anything, you don't have to build anything, you don't have to grow anything, you don't have to cook anything. Just think, and you don't have to walk anywhere. Buses are laid for you, the, the, uh, the bicycles are laid for you. You don't have to walk. So our educational system all over the world, east, west, north, south, and middle, everywhere, whole world is now gripped by this kind of very, very short, limited educational experience. So, what is the answer? We need to challenge this system. And to challenge this system, we say, we have to have an education of head, of course. We are not against left brain. We welcome it. We have it. So we cherish it. We welcome it. But we also have right brain. And we also want to include our, in our education, right brain. And we also have a heart, which is connected with the brain, right brain. So we want to also cultivate heart qualities, courage, for example. Our education, educated young people are very timid, like courage, very fearful, like courage. Car, cool, word car is French for heart. Courage, 
And we have been given the courage. We have been given by the universe. The moment we are born, we are born with heart. And we hardly use our heart. We don't cultivate our heart. And we are timid and we are fearful and we don't know. I need a job, I need money, I need a house, I need this, I need to be provided everything. We have lost the courageous and adventurous and risk-taking um, kind of warrior type of uh, life we have forgotten. And because our education has made us timid, our education has made us fearful, our education has made us don't trust anybody, only trust money, don't trust anybody. Our world suffers from trust deficit disorder. <laughs> trust deficit disorder. This is the greatest disease, greater than cancer, greater than heart disease, greater than any other illness in the world. Trust deficit disorder. So, if we are educating, then I would say at Sri Mahal College we do it, that you, your timetable should be designed in such a way, and, uh, and this is also addressed to our facilitators, like Fez and... and, uh, and um, Tilly. Tilly. Eh? Tilly. Tilly, of course. <laughs> <laughs> my memory is... My brain is going. <laughs> and, and all our um, lecturers and teachers, I always remind them that when you plan your timetable, see one-third for the head, one-third for the heart, and one third for the hand. Gardening and cooking is as important as listening to Satish Kumar or some other person. <laughs> no more important. When you are cooking, washing up, cleaning, that's as important as listening to some big speech for somebody, philosopher, like our Stefan Harding or Gaia or Deep Ecology, anything. They are very important. I'm not demeaning them. I'm doing it myself. But head is good important, we should learn knowledge from our head, but cultivating with your hands, your body, hands are a miracle. It's a miracle, it's a magic. You can take a, a piece of clay and turn them into a, a beautiful, you know Hamada in Japan? Hamada. Hamada? What was his first name? Shoji, Shuroji Hamada? Shoji Hamada. Shoji Hamada. He was a big potter. Pottery. And he came to Duttington, and he made some beautiful pots here. And Bernard Leach in England, we have, we know him, and many, many other great pots. They take ordinary clay and turn into a beautiful pot with your hands. You take ordinary piece of wood and turn them into a beautiful table. You take ordinary some clothes and turn them into this beautiful print. It's only by hand we can do miracle. We can build a house. We can cook the food. We can hold the baby. We can kiss with our, um, our lips and we can hug with our arms. Body, our, our organs are so important, but we have forgotten. We are shy of kissing, shy of hugging, shy of um, cooking, shy of gardening. We don't know anything. We are totally uneducated society as far as hands are concerned. All these prime ministers and presidents and <laughs> CEOs, they are all useless. <laughs> they can't do anything. And so, I want education to bring hands. Every day you should make something. With you. We are just consumers. And particularly AI is coming. Mm -hmm. Dangerous. Mm -hmm. AI, artificial intelligence. You don't need to make anything. Machines will make for you. Farms without farmers. Garden without gardeners. Cars without drivers. Building without builders. You don't need to anything. This is a trend in our society. And you don't need to even think. Even our head is going out now. Your essay will be written by artificial intelligence. Your painting will be done by artificial intelligence. What is happening? Humans are going to become unnecessary, superfluous. You don't, only person we will have is consume. Factory will make, you consume and everything will be done for you, you consume. So I want education to transform us into makers. We are not consumers, we are makers. We are artists, we are poets. You know the word art, art means making. Artisan, artisan bread means bread made by hand, by 
a maker, artisan. Artist is to make something. Rabindranath Tagore, all those paintings made by him, Picasso, all these wonderful artists. They are, so we are all artists, every one of you. Artist is not a special kind of person, but every person, every one of you and me, every one of us are artists, special kind of artists. So if you include hands in your education, head and hands, then you become craftsman, you become artist, you become a poet. Poet also means a maker. You, you, the Greek word, poesis. Poet means, poetry is not only putting beautiful words like Tagore and, and many others did, Shakespeare, beautiful words on a page. That is poetry because they are making it. They are using their imagination, using their creativity, using their intuition and making beautiful poetry. They are not copying. They are not buying ready-made poem and say, this is my poem. <laughs> no. So you make it. So making, poesis, means to make. So when you are a maker, you become a poet. With your own imagination. If you cook a beautiful dinner with your own imagination, with your own creativity, with your own heart, not just copying recipe book, but from your own experience, then even that food on the table is poetry. Even the garden, beautifully, uh, laid garden and cultivated garden with flowers and herbs and vegetables and tomatoes and colors and it's a beautiful uh, I mean people make pictures and take photos it's a real nature's garden and nature's art and so um, a beautiful garden of poetry so anything you make with your own imagination with your own creativity with your own spontaneity from your own heart from your own hand you become a poet so a poet is not a special kind of person, but every person is a special kind of poet. If you make something, you are a maker. So, <coughs> hands very important. Head, hand, uh, hand, head, and hands. And then a heart. Heart is very important. From the heart comes relationship. From heart comes courage. From heart comes love. What is good of living in the world if you can't love? You can, you can uh, create Apple computer or um, soft, software or Microsoft or Amazon or whatever you create, but have no love. What's the point of it? So love, <coughs> I would like <coughs> every curriculum, universities and colleges and schools and primary schools and secondary schools, teach what is love? How we learn to love? Like you can learn to speak French and German, and you can learn to play violin, and you can learn to play piano, and you can learn to build a house, you can learn to do gardening, you can learn to do cooking, you can learn to love. But we don't teach anybody how to love. We don't talk about love. It's a personal matter. It's a personal matter. It's not personal matter. Love is personal, love is social, love is political, love is economical, love is everything. Ecological, everything. So we need to teach young people how to respect each other, how to be kind to other people, how to be compassionate to other people, how to, how to relate to other people, how to do things for each other. All that comes from the heart. But our heart is totally uneducated. Our hands are uneducated, our hearts are educated, and only head, head, head. <coughs> so, we need to create a curriculum in our schools and universities where three aspects are, and also legs. I mean, I say head, heart, and hands because it's a beautiful um, kind of alliteration and, and it's three words to, to remember. But whole body, education of whole body, legs. We have forgotten how to walk. I would like to see people living not too far from their work and walk to work. One hour or 20 minutes or 40 minutes walking to work and then walking back. Good exercise. You don't need to go to gym. <laughs> Just go to work. And then your exercise. 40 minutes of walking or 30 minutes of walking. And then you have fresh air. And if necessary, in countries like India or Japan or where the hot countries, every office should have a shower. Yeah, and you, if you're hot, and you are sweaty, you can have a shower after you arrive in your workplace. So, walking. I mean, I walk from India to America. 
for two and a half years, I walked from New Delhi to Pakistan, to Afghanistan, Iran, Azerbaijan, Albania, Georgia, Russia, Moscow, Belarus, Poland, Germany, Belgium, France, England, America, Japan, and back to India. Two and a half years, 15 countries without a single penny in my pocket. I learned how to walk. My mother was a walker. We had a farm from our uh, house uh, about two miles away. And she would walk in the morning when the sun is on the back. Uh, because the farm was on the kind of west of our house. She bought the farm on the west. So that in the morning when she walked, sun is on the back. And in the evening when she comes back, sun is on the back. <laughs> that was wise, wise decision to make. <laughs> and she, and we, my father used to have a horse. And, and he will sometimes say, we have a horseman. Anchi, her name was Anchi. Anchi, take the horse and horseman. Why are you walking? It's too sweaty, too... Um, hot. She said, no, I want to walk. How would you like if a horse wanted to ride on you? <laughs> she will not take horse. Walk. And I was four years, five years, six years old, and I'll walk with her. And then when I was walking with her, she will show me the trees, and she will show me the, talk about the clouds, and talk about the, about the uh, rainbows, or talk about the bees, and talk about the flowers, and talk about stories, and talk about singing. Empty time. When you are walking, you are free. And walking is not only to get somewhere. Walking is to walk the path and enjoy the journey. And that we have forgotten. Every time we build roads, build motorways, build railways, build um, uh, trams, build, build, build. Nobody needs to be walked. I think we should have a culture of walking. So head, heart, hands and legs as well. Yes, yeah. <laughs> legs as well. So, and if you walk, I mean, at the moment, there's a lot of uh, illness, obesity, or a kind of mental problems, or health problems. Uh, National Health Service in England is breaking, breaking point. There's not enough doctors, not enough nurses. Nobody asks why our society is getting so many ill and sick people. Nobody's asking. They ask me, I say, because we don't exercise. And simplest and best exercise is walk. And walk to work. Walk to your farm. Walk to your shopping. Walk to your school. Children should walk half an hour to their school. Why you have to have a bus? You don't need fossil fuel, creating global warming, climate change. You walk, no climate change, no global warming. You have a problem of global warming, I have a solution. Start walking. <laughs> That's a solution. You don't need all these. I mean, if I could walk 15, um, uh, 15 countries and, and 8,000 miles in two and a half years, and what about the two and a half years I would have done nothing. If I was in a school or university or college, I would learn very little, just by head, books, stale knowledge. But when I'm walking, I learn about the mountains, the deserts, the snow, the forest, the people, the cultures, the poetry, the music, the cathedrals, the churches, the mosques, the, the foods. Empty, empty knowledge I got by, you read my book, Pilgrimage for Peace, and I'm describing it all, how, what I learned. If I had been in a university for two and a half years, I would not have learned 10% of what I learned by walking the world. So we have many problems, illness, we have problems of climate change, we have problems of many other kinds. One solution, walk. <laughs> One solution, walk, single solution. So. That's the kind of education we need, head, heart, and hands. And this is what we are trying to, not perfect, Shumanku is not perfect. Still we get our conditioning and we used to get this idea of too much head and not enough hands and hearts and legs, but we are trying. At least that's our aim. And so if we can bring our body, mind is, is there, but the home for the mind, and home for intellect is our body. Body is a temple. Body is sacred. And in your body is the divine presence of consciousness. God is not separate behind the clouds sitting there. God is in your heart. God is in your body. God is in your consciousness. Divine spirit. Brahmasmi. In Sanskrit we have a, um, um, a, a mantra. Brahmasmi. I am Brahma. 
I am Brahma means God or divine or divine uh, sacred. I am Brahmasmi, Aham. Shivo Ham, Shivo Ham, Shivo Ham. I am a Shiva. So, how do you have that consciousness? How do you feel that immense, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, when we bring our hands together, that we are microcosm of macrocosm. The macrocosm includes the non-physical world, includes the divine and sacred world of gods and goddesses and all the consciousness. So how do you have that self-realization that I am something more than just my body? I am my body, but this body is a sacred temple for greater consciousness and greater heart and imagination and creativity and spirituality and joy and pleasure and ananda. So all those that have forgotten. So we want to broaden our kind of horizon. We want to broaden our consciousness. And we have to make every child feel that I am I'm here as divine being and here to make the world a beautiful place. That's the kind of education we need. I'm here with a meaning in my life, purpose behind my life. I'm not just here to get a job and serve BP or or ASDA or some big Apple or Amazon company and get a salary and get a pension and die. That's not the purpose of my life here. I have a me greater meaning, greater purpose. I'm a poet, I'm an artist, I'm a creator, I'm a maker, I'm a divine spirit. That kind of education we want. Children coming out with big heart and big consciousness and embracing the world and trying to make the world a beautiful place. And education can do it. We can do it. We can learn to be like that. It's only learning. Everything is learning. Anybody who speaks, has two lips and mouth and lips and tongue can sing. But we don't teach singing to everybody. Only a few people learn to sing out of the school and then they become professional singers and they get albums and they get money and the rest of us just listen to the album and that's it. No! I want every one of us to sing. This morning, when we finish before lunch, I'll sing with you. I'll teach you a small, uh, short song. So anybody who can have two legs can dance. Dancers are not just in the, in the concert hall or the ballet or the theater or uh, a kind of convent, uh, what do you call convent, convent garden. Everybody can dance. This should not be a profession. It should be practice of everybody. Dance, sing, play, music, write poetry, cook food, do garden, and do science, of course. I'm not against science, but just science everything, and technology everything, and humans are just useless, and just discard them. There's no you, just be servant, and if you are good. Our economic system and educational system has turned human into a resource for the economic growth for money making, for profit, for business, for big companies. You and I are nothing other than just a little cog in the machine. They call it HR. Have you heard of HR in our department? HR means human resources. So you are only a resource. <laughs> resource for what? Making profit, running a business, running a company. You are not a resource. You are human dignity. I want HR to stand not for human resources, but human relationship. We are all related to each other. Relationship is more important than... And then our economic system has not only an educational system, has not only turned humans into a resource, but also nature is a resource. Natural resources, we call them. Human resources, natural resources. And who has become the master? Economy. And what is economy? Economy is not economy. Because economy is a very beautiful word. Economy means management of the planet home. Ecos means in Greek, planet home. Whole earth is my home. Ecos. And nomos means management. Management of the planet home. So economy is a very beautiful word. But when they say economy, the economy, it's not economy, it's a money nomi. <laughs> management of money. Banking and, and commerce and, and, and transactions and a profit and budget and bottom line are all nothing to do with the economy, uh, just about money. 
when I went to teach and uh, speak at the London School of Economics. And I asked them, do you know the meaning of the word economics? And they didn't. London School of Economics. <laughs> and they didn't know what economics means. They only taught them banking and management of money and all that. I said, no. Economy means management of planet home. And I said to them that and you, if you want to manage the planet home, you have to know your planet. You, you need to know your home. And therefore, you must teach ecology and economy. Ecology means knowledge of the planet home. Logos means knowledge. Ecology. Ecos, logos. Those two words make ecology. So, unless you know your home, how are you going to manage it? In order to manage something, you have to know it. If I'm made in charge of this old postal, then please manage the old postal. And I have to know every room, I have to know every furniture, I need to know kitchen, I need to know uh, bathroom, I need to know everything. Then I can manage it. If I don't know, how am I going to manage it? So I said to LSE, please change the name of your university. <laughs> <laughs> and call it LSEE, -E, London School of Ecology and Economics. So our educational system, away from head, heart, and hands, has turned nature into a resource, humans into a resource, humans are unnecessary, we don't need your talent, we don't need your thinking, we don't need your intelligence, we don't need your hands, we don't need you, just be a consumer. Our task, all of us, you and I all included, is to challenge this system and create a new system. And you have Kaduri Earth Program, wonderful, and, and Schumacher College, and there are Vandana Shiva in India creating like this a, a new college where there's a 50 acre farm. And on that farm, this, the students go and learn about how to save seeds, how to differentiate seeds, which seed is what, to know seeds. Knowing your seeds like reading a book. Knowing your seed, which seed is what. People don't know. People, our young people in the universities and in a city like uh, London or New York or Hong Kong or Beijing, they don't know where the milk is coming from. They think milk is coming from what bottle. <laughs> yeah, they don't know cows. They don't know anything. They don't know anything about nature. And so uh, there are new places all around the world coming up. And, and so Schumacher College has also inspired a few uh, places like in Brazil, the Escola Schumacher, and there is a, a small in uh, China, mainland China as well, uh, Shumi, Shumi Garden, and, and also in Colombia, and, uh, and, uh, and Shiva. Hmm? Belgium. Well? Belgium. Belgium, yeah, Schumacher Sprouts in Belgium. So there are places like that uh, sprouting and emerging, but we need a big revolution. And we need to have skills, hand skills, heart skills, thinking skills, making skills, and, 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 a, and a kind of imagining skills. That's my uh, ideal education. I can go on talking, but I think it'd be good to, good to have a lot of time for questions and comments and discussions and your ideas and your thinking about education. Thank you. Who would like to raise first question or comment? Yes. Yes. And I was responsible for five schools. Yes. And I take a lot of your thoughts and inspiration uh, to create this uh, new school. If yes. we launched a new school in 2020. Yes. During the pandemic year, it was yeah. very challenging. Yes. And you have this. Uh, inspiration from head, heart, and hands. Yeah. We create this uh, space for garden and cooking. Yes. And then for all the students. So you are there okay. with us. Yes. Uh, every day, and I would like to say thank you very much.
yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Brazil is a wonderful country. I'm coming to Brazil next year oh. in April. Yeah, and Escola Schumacher, uh, Bia Beatrice, she's uh, organizing it, and some other people. So I am coming to Brazil. And yes, that's a wonderful, that's a good example that you are starting. And I would like to see many, because you know, the big change will not come from the existing universities. Big change had to come from a small, like Schumacher College, like Escola Schumacher, like your school, like Bandana Shiva's place, like Bhumi College, there are many, many small, small initiatives. When these become more powerful, and many, many more people go there, and then big universities become less powerful. So in the end, I think that uh, big universities will wither away. If we can create a strong uh, grassroots movement, from bottom up movement, so that we take responsibility, not wait for Oxford and Cambridge to change, not wait for government to change, because they are going to be the last to change. But we who have a consciousness and we can start the initiative, small scale, a big tree comes out of a small seed. A big river is made of many, many small uh, streams. And so a big movement comes from many, many small initiatives. So your school of that kind is part of that big change which is coming, emerging. And we all need to give our best, our contribution. If we make, because if we say, oh, I can't do anything, I'm only one small individual. No, everyone has a great power. Every one of us are a potential Mahatma Gandhi or a potential uh, Martin Luther King or Mother Teresa or anybody. They are all like you and me, human beings, but they encourage themselves and, and use their heart, use their hands, use their imagination and, and let, let the fear and the timidity and became strong and resilient and gave their life. So if we do that, we can bring about change. Satish? Yes. You've spoken to deans and minister, etc. You've just said they will be the last one to change. Yes. Why? Because they have got vested interest. Mm -hmm. And they are so conditioned to think that my power, my prestige, my control, my money, my status, my salary, these are important, not human dignity, not nature. So they are protecting and they are wedded to this technological and artificial intelligence and mass production and mass consumption and mass distribution, everything big, big, big. They are vested interest and they are stuck in it and they are conditioned to think like that. Whereas if we are in at a grassroots level, we are not that conditioned. We are conditioned, but we still have a little bit of freedom. So we can start new initiatives. So I think, um, I mean, there are some possibly some people in the government might be thinking differently, but uh, they have much more constraint, they have much more restrictions. And so I would say that don't wait. I mean, top-down change is more difficult. Bottom up, you can build like, a, if you build a house, you build from the foundation. And brick by brick and stone by stone and piece of wood by piece of wood, you build a house. But you have to start from the foundation, grassroots level. So in the same way, if you want to bring a new system, then you have to start at the bottom. You can't start from the top. So when you go to talk to London school, etc., you don't see that they are getting it or moving a bit? Uh, yes, yes. They, are, they said that we can't change the name. <laughs> but but we, will, we are listening to you and we'll bring some more ecological studies, more environmental studies, more nature studies, we will bring, they, they did say that. Uh, so yes, they are, they are trying to do something and also many governments are uh, changing to address the climate change and, and that kind of thing is happening. Uh, but still I would say that is happening only because the pressure from the bottom, from the people is strong. Uh, when uh, there was uh, in 1973 a center for alternative technology in Wales. And they started to put windmills and solar panels in 73. And at that time, not a single windmill in Britain was producing renewable energy. And people laughed at them and said, you idealistic fools, you think that the needs of a British industry can be met 
by your windmills and solar panels is just a kind of pipe dream. It's a kind of fool's paradise. Nothing going to happen. Everybody laughed at them. But I knew them and they said, no, we are, we are going to be pioneers. And I think our solution is uh, that we should go for renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And now after what, 73 or something like 50 years later, one third of energy in Britain is coming from renewable resources. Mm -hmm. One third and getting more and more and more. And now Labour government, which is maybe the ne next government, saying that we want to make 60-70% of our energy coming from solar panels and, 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 uh, and um, windmills. But my thinking is that even though I support solar panels and windmills and renewable energy, but we need to reduce our use of energy. We go on increasing, 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 um, even solar panels and windmills are not going to be sufficient. Because even to build solar panels and windmills, you need a lot of metal, you need a lot of plastic, you need a lot of materials. And how much can you do it? This is a finite world. You cannot have infinite resources. So our needs for energy should be less, small. And of course, I'm middle way. I'm not extremist. I'm not saying that don't use any energy, but don't use too much energy. So if we have a middle path, so that you have a little bit of use of energy, but our body has a lot of energy. We can build a house, we can cook food, we can garden, we can make things. Use our energy, which is free electricity. We have body, we have intelligence, we have everything. Why we are going for this artificial intelligence and artificial technology when this body is the best technology that you can imagine? Can technology, robots cannot produce intelligent Really, human intelligence cannot ma match uh, with uh, robotic intelligence. How much artificial intelligence you have, it can never match human intelligence. And we don't use human intelligence enough. Our 80% of our uh, human intelligence is unused. It's just not developed, not encouraged. So if we encourage and develop our human intelligence, real intelligence, that's a much better than all these technological solutions. Yes. Yes, and that's uh, really a nice uh, bridge to uh, my institute, yeah. Bar Institute, which um, is in the written example of such a mm -hmm. um, small institute mm -hmm. that um, starts uh, um, um, rethinking indeed um, what it means to be uh, a living being, mm -hmm. to be a human, mm -hmm. and uh, we focus on the development of transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. Intelligence collective intelligence, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your appreciation, but also congratulations to your work and your institute is very good. And it's, it, I want to add about that it, it, at the same time it's very hard because you begin, I, have, um, uh, I just had a conversation with an uh, educational innovator at Utrecht University. I worked as a year, for years as a postdoc at university. Yeah. And um, he said exactly the same as what you said, was saying. He said, yeah, we had just had found an alliance of transdisciplinary universities departments and he said if you want to create something new you have to start from scratch because universities are among the most conservative institutes in the world. Yeah. And you work as, as an edu as an educational scientist within the old university. So he also recommends uh, everyone that like like you. Uh, yeah. yeah 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 and you have to start a new and then you can be setting an example for yeah. the 
They will come last. Yeah. They, but they do have mass. So yeah. 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 In that sense, they. Um, so perhaps my question that I have is: you already mentioned some of the inspiring institutes of the grassroots movements. Yeah. The college being, of course, an important leader in that network. Um, do you have uh, more examples? You know, we've mentioned Shiva, Bandana Shiva. Bandana Shiva. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, are there more? Initiatives that you have seen over over, over your, your large network say, well, this is really they are yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, there are initiatives around the world. There is a very nice, um, uh, n- nothing is perfect, but uh, it's a very nice uh, uh, Californian Institute of Integral Studies. Mm-hmm. That's a very good holistic uh, study center, and we have collaborated with them. And, and a number of people have come from there, and, uh, and I've been there. And so, so there is a, a kind of California Institute of Integral Studies, that's very good. Then Kaduri Farm, from where our two um, participants coming, that's oh, another, yeah, yeah. yeah that's oh, a, oh. another good, good place, a good kind of education, Kaduri um, Earth Program, and, and they have a good program there. And I think they are bringing a, a green hub uh, in Hong Kong which is also very good. And so, so there are initiatives like that uh, all around the world. Uh, there are many, many uh, places uh, people are doing something. And also we have a history. Um, um, Summer Hill and, uh, was a good school. And, uh, and, um, and um, uh, Paolo Freire uh, created a, a, a kind of pedagogy of the oppressed. was a very good. Ivan Illich, a de-schooling society. So we have got lots of thinkers and people who have uh, developed these ideas of head, heart and hands and a whole person education, how we can bring that so that uh, human potential is used uh, in its full sense and not just left undeveloped. So, but this industrial system of centralized, centrally controlled monoculture, this monoculture, everybody must behave in the same way Uniformity. Our world is trying to create uniformity. So you have same computer everywhere in the world, more or less, or one or two different companies, but something similar. And, and this high-rise buildings, and McDonald's food, and, and Coca-Cola, and blue jeans, and a monoculture. Everybody educated the same way. I want diversity to be celebrated. Each and every one is different. And we should, we will add the France. We should celebrate our diversity. It's wonderful to have many religions, many cultures, many languages, um, biodiversity, religious diversity, national diversity, political diversity, economic diversity, religious diversity, truth diversity. You are 20 people here, but each and every one of us are different. Although we all have a, a two eyes and two ears and uh, two lips, but they're all different. We all speak English, but they all speak with different, uh, slightly different accent. Each person has a unique contribution to make. So diversity of education and diversity of cultures, that is a crux of the matter. And what is problem, all our problems today coming from this idea of uniformity. Not unity, but uniformity. Unity is not uniformity. <coughs> unity is not monoculture. Unity works in hand in hand with diversity. Unity and diversity dance together and not destroy diversity. Diversity is not divisions. It's wonderful to have many religions, many colors, many languages, many philosophies. It, it would be boring if eight billion people were for, for speaking only one language, be it Chinese or Russian or, or American or European or Swahili or Sanskrit, any language. It's good to have many languages. So good to have many cultures. So the head, heart and hands education is about diversity, not monoculture, not uniformity. At the moment, our mainstream (coughs) education is producing young people like a factory, knowledge factory, Mm. knowledge factory. Same kind of um, exam, same kind of testing, same kind, you must become 10,000 engineers, same kind, 10,000 doctors, same kind, 10,000 this, 10,000 that. Every university producing sameness. I would like um, education to be liberated and each person is educated to be themselves. 
be themselves, be yourself. You are a unique being and, and you have a unique purpose in this life. And so embrace diversity, celebrate diversity. That's the kind of head, heart and hand education. And, and also we, we uh, met you, well, what I also, uh, let's just say what you, you, you were saying, that um, everyone is born with um, intrinsic purpose, mm. intrinsic um, thing to give to this world. Mm. If, and that's why also that we've turned it around, we say, well, you have to, you have to look to the outside world yeah. to know what you have to become. Yeah. But I think what you should do is to ask the person, every baby knows yeah. what, what he has to do here. And yeah. How. yeah. So you have to have space to develop and then discover it. Yeah, and be yourself. Yes, and that's also in my organization. We don't work with uh, job descriptions. But yeah. We say, well, we look at people that resonate with the mission. Yeah. And then we go into a dialogue. And yeah. In dialogue, yeah. Uh, we uh, establish what yeah. it is that you have to uh, um, have to, what I call this mutual uh, um, reciprocity, reciprocity, reciprocal adaptation. Yeah, reciprocal so, education. And then you are um, say, okay, who are you? What are, what do you want to, what is your meaning in life? What do you have to do with in the scope of your mission? Yeah. And then wonderful things happen. And people, yeah. yeah. It's something else that you say, well, we look for your computer program or communications mm. officer. Or, um, that's already, I think, in a job market, it's already perverse that yeah, you yeah. look for job, if I human resources, I'm yeah, looking yeah. for a science. I don't yeah. look for human. Yeah, yeah. For a few science, you look for a manager. Okay. okay. For Let's have some other questions. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm curious about the uh, heart element yes. of the three. Because I feel like um, you were talking about the capacity of our, of our brain. You know, we only use a small amount and we want to develop so we can have this sort of expanded idea. Yeah. Um, I see, when I look at our culture, I'm thinking about my conditioning and how I've grown up. I feel like the infrastructure, if that's the right word, around how to practice. Uh, heart-based uh, activities and to expand also our capacity of loving, which feels like we're only living a very narrow... <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, I'm just curious to hear you talk more about in your ideas or vision or experience of other institutions, what are the practices and ways that you see the heart element and the love as well that I see is also transforming the way we use our hands yeah. and the way we use our head. So yeah. for me, like that feels more... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In our culture, we have reduced love to a very, very minimal kind of level, like romantic love or erotic love or something like that. I think of falling in love and falling out of love. <laughs> so, love is that is good love, of course. We have a personal love, an intimate love. But intimate love leads to ultimate love, what I call radical love. And the ultimate love is. Whatever you do, you do it because of love. So you love gardening, you love cooking, you love writing poetry, you love building a house, you love uh, painting a picture, you love singing. Whatever you do, you do it out of love rather than kind of, I sing to make money, I sing to, uh, I dance to earn money, I build a house to earn money. Purpose of work has changed and, and love has become secondary and personal and all our work is to earn money, to pay the bills and so on. So heart-based education is to educate every one of us to think that whatever you do, you do it for love and money uh, paying you is only a by the way, it means to an end. The end is love and money is the means. Now, the money has become the end, and, and love, if at all, become the means. And so, if you want to spread this heart-based culture, then love has to permeate bigger than just kind of romantic love, well, falling in love with a man or woman, or, or with woman or with man or whatever, uh, personal level. Go beyond that and say, whatever we do, purpose of doing is because I want, I love it, I, I appreciate it, I enjoy it, I celebrate it, it's a kind of bliss in it. I cook for somebody, uh, I, I garden, I, whatever I do. So if you can create that kind of consciousness, that's a kind of widespread love. 
intimate love and the ultimate love. The ultimate love is to make love as a purpose, the meaning uh, and the end goal of your life and, and make all other things as a means to an end. Then also I call it radical love. My book is called Radical Love. And radical love, and I compare that with moderate love. And a moderate love is more like you love your parents, you love your, your, your neighbors, you love your friends, you love your colleagues. But you love without any judgment. You love without any limit. You love without expectation. No expectation that if I love you, and you love me back. That's a moderate love if you're expecting to be loved back. But if we can teach our children that you love for the sake of loving, whether you are loved back or not is not to be considered. Of course, if you love somebody, you get love back. But don't worry about it. Don't expect it. Let it happen and then enjoy it, celebrate it, appreciate it, be grateful for it. But don't expect it. And love even those you don't like. Love even those who, who disagree with. You, you, you can dislike without hating somebody. You can dislike a system like racism or uh, colonialism or imperialism or some ism. Um, like, uh, like Martin Luther King. I had a great privilege of meeting Martin Luther King. He was against racism, but not against white people. He was the embodiment of love. He was a full of heart in his life. He lived only for 35 years. He was killed at 35 uh, age age 35, but for 29 times he went to jail. But out of love for white as well as the black, and black as well as the white. He had no hatred, but he wanted to change the system. So you can be radical, you can be radical love, is love of Martin Luther King, example of Martin Luther King, or Mahatma Gandhi, or Nelson Mandela. People are radical, they are revolutionaries, they want to bring good order in society, but without hatred. Hatred is a too heavy a burden to carry. They don't carry burden of hatred. They want to transform societies without hating, without demeaning your opponent. Everybody has a place, and some people are misguided. They are, de they are conditioned to think in a certain way. They are capitalists, they are communists, they are imperialists, they are racist, they are sexist, whatever they are. You have to love them. Only through love you can transform. You cannot transform by hatred. You can kill with hatred, but you cannot transform with hatred. So if you want to transform somebody, if you read Mahatma Gandhi's biography, he was for 20 years in South Africa. And there was a, a, a kind of like a ruler in South Africa. Is anybody here from South Africa? No. Um, ruler called Smut. And Gandhi and Smut had the kind of opposing, uh, because the Indians had to, uh, to have a pass uh, to go anywhere. They had to register themselves. They were discriminated. Uh, they, had no, they cannot move from one state to the other state. Lots of uh, discriminatory. And Gandhi opposed it. And for 20 years, he fought in South Africa. And in the end, Smut was transformed. And law was changed. And if you read the tribute paid by Smut to, Smut to Gandhi, it's quite incredible. An opponent who for 20 years Gandhi fought against, and in the end, he was praised by the dictator and said, I'm changing the rule, Gandhi was right. Same with Martin Luther King. 29 times he was put in jail, but now America has a Martin Luther King Day as a holiday. So you can transform society, you can transform systems by love. You cannot transform with hatred. And so all the great teachers of the world, from Buddha to Jesus Christ to Mother Teresa to, to, uh, to Mahatma Gandhi to Martin Luther King to, to Vandana Shiva to Bangari Mathai to many, many other people you can see, they are all acting out of love. The power of love is transformative. You, can, you know, I wrote an article in research called Alchemy of Love. And alchemy means transformation. You transform base metal into gold. Now, this is, I think it's a metaphor. So you transform an enemy into a friend. That's a transformative power of love. So that's a heart. So it goes much further than 
just a kind of romantic and erotic love which you fall in love. It's a kind of bigger picture that our society and our life and our work and our thinking is rooted in a kind of bigger, kind of inclusive and kind of bigger kind of vision, bigger values. And that's the kind of heart. The love is, heart is the base of love. Thinking, feeling. Feeling is love. Any other question? Yes. Um, I'm very honored to uh, of meeting you. Yeah. And my question is, uh, do you think of the part of solution is to uh, help people to deal with their emotion uh, and even to learn kids to deal with their emotion? Because yeah. nowadays I think we are the emotion is a problem, so if you feel, feel yeah. you need to put outside and you need to be very uh, practical yes. mind. Yes. So, yes. do you think if people start to feel more and express their feelings and, and even their inner child and work their inner child and yeah. their traumas, yeah. uh, the world could be better? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is absolutely right because we are on a journey and the inner trauma and, and, and fear and a kind of um, uh, emotions and all those things, sentiments, all those things are part of our upbringing and part of our being. We are humans which includes everything they were in the world. We are a microcosm of macrocosm. So there's a little bit of fear, a little bit of anger, a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of everything, negative and positive, but also love and compassion and kindness. So now, when we are making a journey, and this is what all the great teachers have told us and taught us, poets, great poets, great artists, great spiritual people, teachers, they always say, now, human life is given to make this journey, how to overcome your kind of uh, negative emotions and transform them into positive emotions. So how to transform kind of um, uh, fear into hope and trust. How to transform anger into love and kindness. How to transform, this is alchemy. And this is our journey, we have a work to do. We are given this 60, 70, 80 years of life. It's a journey and we have work to do to move from kind of in Sanskrit we say asatoma, sadgamaya, tamasoma, jyotirgamaya, mrityorma, amritam gamaya. We mean lead me from death to life, from falsehood to truth, lead me from despair to hope, from fear to trust, lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. So this journey towards a kind of more holistic and more comforting and more joyful and blissful um, kind of uh, uh, reality, which is in us, it is there. They're both there, like day and night, they go together. There's nothing uh, which we don't have. And they all have place. A little bit of fear is also important. A little bit of, little bit of um, kind of um, negative uh, feelings are important. Like in a, in a meal, you have a little bit of salt or a little bit of chili. So that's a kind of part of life. So we are not saying that uh, everything but it has to be completely only love and nothing else. But love should be more dominant. So if you have a food and you are making cauliflower or rice or dal, the majority of food is kind of sweet and delicious. Not too sweet, not like sugar, but basically uh, good. Uh, but you add a little bit of sugar uh, or a little bit of salt, a little bit of chili to make it a little bit more, uh, more kind of tasty or exciting. And so in the same way with life, in life, your inner child, your inner emotions, your inner feelings, so all there. And how you, you deal with that, how you handle your emotions, how you handle your sentiments, how you handle your um, negative feelings, and, 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 and be the master of your life. This is the challenge, and this is the journey of your life. You, we are, you are the CEO of your life. <laughs> how you handle your life is up to you. You are the master. You are in charge of your life. Nobody else can do it. You can learn from other people. You can learn from poetry, from music, from teachers and so on. But in the end, you have to take 
in your, uh, your life in your hands and live that life in a such a way that you are full of joy for yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to love yourself, trust yourself, believe in yourself that I am capable of living a good life for myself and for the whole world. That conviction, that belief and that love for yourself. You can't love the world if you don't love yourself. So loving yourself and that's how you deal with your emotions and your inner child. Okay, so any other question? We have got 10 more minutes. Yes. Yeah. I have one uh, following the, the questions about the heart. Yeah. And you mentioned like vanilla shifters and uh, like you, they, you do with heart and for radical change. And when you bring radical change, people are one, they don't want it, even though your motivation is love. So you, I imagine you will face a lot of like uh, criticisms and hatreds, and sometimes you will doubt, uh, am I doing correct? I just used one example is I will say uh, environmental activism. Well, you mentioned? Uh, environmental activism. Activism. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I did my like, activist. Uh, actions, yeah. Action. Action, yeah, yeah. She activism. used to be an activist. Activist, yeah. And then I do something that is like more non-violent, but people feel very upset. And then always I have the feelings, you need a big heart, a strong heart. Even though people are like, criticizing you, you still need to love. I just want to learn from you and how you maintain that strong love to insist for radical change. Yes, yes, yes. Now, um, activism is good. I'm activist, you are activist. But activism, non-violent activism, is, first of all, your activism comes from your love. Love for other people. Love for those who are in the old system. Mm -hmm. So you are not hatred, mm -hmm. you are love. You want to change the system without hating people. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between system and a people. Imperialism is a system. Mm -hmm. Or uh, capitalism is a system. Racism is a system. Mm -hmm. Sexism is a system. It's a kind of belief system. So we change the system and by changing the system, we transform the people's heart. So non-violent action is that while we are doing this action, any suffering I take upon myself and not in, in, inflict suffering on somebody else. So uh, Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, these people took suffering upon themselves. They went to prison, uh, they fasted, uh, whatever, but they didn't hurt or or impose any suffering on somebody else. So even if you are criticized, and of course they were criticized, you take it okay. But you put flowers in the path of those who put um, uh, thorns in your path. Because that generosity of heart eventually will win. Mm -hmm. And eventually Nelson Mandela became president. Eventually. Mahatma India became independent. Eventually, women had more liberation. Eventually, racism is now less than what it used to be. Things take time to change, but don't inflict suffering on others. Take suffering upon yourself. That's the real activism. And, and when you take suffering upon yourself, you arouse the compassion, the kindness, the sympathy in other people. Say, look, this is, he's fasting or he's going to jail. Mahatma Gandhi said to the magistrate, when he was putting him in jail, say, magistrate said to him, Mr. Gandhi, I have to send you to jail, but I hope that the British government will release you sooner. He said, sir, don't worry about me going to jail. I will go to prison like a bridegroom goes to wedding chamber with very happiness. I want to go to jail. I will suffer, but I want to change the system. So if you do with that love and heart in your heart, and we have many good examples for that. We are prepared to give our life, but we are not prepared to take anybody else's life. There are good causes for which I can die, but there are no good enough causes for which I can kill. That is the principle of nonviolent activism. So if you practice that, there'll be disappointments, 
there will be ups and downs. It took 20 years, Mahatma Gandhi, to change uh, apart, uh, law in um, South Africa. It took 27 years for Nelson Mandela to change apartheid in South Africa and become president of South Africa. So it will take time. We have to have patience. When God made time, he made plenty of it. We don't have to think that everything must be achieved today or tomorrow. We do our best and things will change when circumstances are right, circumstances are ready, and all, this, all the kind of things come together, things will change. But in the meantime, I mean, in Hong Kong, there's a lot of protest movement, but it's not completely non-violent. It's a kind of not taking suffering upon yourself, but putting suffering on others, creating chaos or inconvenience to others. No, Gandhian non-violence, non-violence out of love, does not include that kind of action. Non-violent action has to come from full of heart, full of love, for communists, for Xi Jinping, for whoever you are, we love you, we want to sit down with you, we'll give you a cup of tea, but let's talk about it to change the system. So that kind of generosity of spirit is necessary to be a good activist. Okay. Okay. Sorry? Yes, 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 please. Thank you. Yeah. I want to ask, thank you for your talking, and uh, I have a question about the water bottom, and uh, you often say, uh, uh, what we play, play is work. Play is work. Yeah, play is work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Work, yeah, play is work. Yeah, 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 sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, and uh, I want to know the difference from, uh, so, hobby, uh, So you are you saying that uh, walking can be a hobby? Hmm? That's what you are saying? Uh, work. Huh? Work. Hobby from work. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Now, hobby is a kind of you know the word dilettante. Dilettante. No, it's a French word which means it's not serious. It's a kind of pastime. You do something as a kind of pastime for a little bit of pleasure. Work is kind of way of life, serious. So for me, I don't, I mean, I don't have hobbies. Whatever I do is work. Writing is work, speaking is work, gardening is work, cooking is work, work. So working, with love, and work is good. Working will make me who I am. Khalil Gibran, there was a great Lebanese poet called Khalil Gibran, and he wrote a book called Prophet, and he said in this book that work is to make love visible. It's an expression of love. You make love visible by making a beautiful table, a beautiful chair, a beautiful pot, a beautiful house, a beautiful food, a beautiful garden, beautiful clothes, beautiful whatever you make, because you love making. So you make your love visible, manifest, come out. You feel love for everything, but it's all inside you. So how you make it manifest, make it visible by work. So work is good. There is a, a book by E.F. Schumacher called Good Work. We all need to work. This modern society says working is no good. We should let the machines work. No, working is good for our health, mental health, physical health, spiritual health, emotional health. We need to make something, do something. We, our body is made to work. We, our hands, our legs, everything needs to work. And so, for me, hobby is a little bit superficial. It's a kind of dilettante. This is a kind of, I do it when I have a bit of moment, but it doesn't matter. But work is a part of way of life. And so I would say, love your work 
and, and make whatever you are making with love, not as a hobby, but as a work. And work does not need to be paid. It can be voluntary work. It can be a mother is looking after a child. That's work, a serious work. She may not be paid by bringing a child into the world, but a mother is a hero. She's carrying a baby for nine months in her womb and being, giving birth to the child, the life and death experience, and then feeding the child with her own breast and looking after the child and wiping the bottom and everything. That's work. It may not be paid, but it's a real, sincere and serious work. And it's done by love. So everything you are producing is your baby. A garden is your baby. Cooking is your baby. Craft is your baby. Art is your baby. For Picasso, making a big picture of Guernica, is her, his baby. He produced it. And it's a lot of work, a lot of days, a lot of thinking, a lot of hard work, uh, day and night. So work for me is good. Hobby is okay, it's dilettante, it's not so, yeah, it's not so serious. Okay, any more questions, keep them for the evening. I'll be with you this evening, and I'll talk a little bit more about radical love this evening, and, and any other questions. So, we will end with a little song. The old song. <laughs> And it was translated by an English poet called Ted Hughes. And I found it somewhere in his book, collection of some poetry. So this is about um, beauty. I walk in beauty before me. I walk in beauty behind me. I walk in beauty above me. I walk in beauty below me. I walk in beauty all around me. The whole world is beautiful. The whole world is beautiful. The whole world is beautiful. Ho! You have to say ho in the end. Yeah. Now everybody. Behind me, I walk in beauty above me. I walk in beauty below me. I walk in beauty all around me. The whole world is beautiful. The whole world is beautiful. The whole world is beautiful. Hold on! Good. Go back in your home tomorrow and create beauty. Your life is beautiful, your family is beautiful, your work is beautiful. Remember beauty always. Love and beauty go together. When you do something lovingly, it will be beautiful. And beauty are all beautiful. Nature is very beautiful. Flowers, even thorns on the roses are beautiful. Trees are beautiful. Birds are beautiful. Why industrial civilization is creating so much ugliness? So we need to make beauty. If we have beauty, nothing else will be needed. Beauty and love go together. Have a good lunch. Thank you. <laughs>